Okay, so again, I'm going to talk on the number of applications that uh, botulism toxin has been used for. Probably over the last 10 years, this has really come up. Uh, start with, we'll talk a little bit about the mechanism of action, talk about how Botox is administered and some technical considerations before getting into adverse events, uh, and then really delving into the data which supports its use for neurogenic, detrusor overactivity, idiopathic, overactive bladder, and then we'll touch on just some other uses, namely BPH and interstitial cystitis at the end of the talk. So, uh, when you first think of Botox or botulism toxin, you probably, you may harken back to medical school when we were told that spores live in honey and don't give honey to kids under one year of age. More likely, you think of its use in cosmetic um, medicine and its use in wrinkles. In fact, uh, botulism toxin dates back to the 1800s when a German physician by the name of Kerner described it as the sausage poison. Some 80 years later, it was isolated from a piece of ham by a, a Belgian who took a a uh, piece of ham from who, which had killed three people and, and found Clostridium botulism. Take a, another 90 year break before it really started to gain traction within clinical medicine and a Vancouver note, it was first described in the use of uh, cosmetic medicine uh, by the Carruthers uh, who were just nearby in their, uh, their publication in 92. And the first urological publication was in 1990 and its use in DSD. Here are the indications from the FDA that are listed for botulism toxin. You'll note that there's no current urological indications, but despite this, its use in things like orthopedics, ENT, and of course urology have really exploded over the last 10 years. So this is a cartoon de uh, depicting kind of the normal release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. As the nerve uh, stimulates the, the junction, you note that the vesicle migrates towards the uh, synaptic cleft interacts with a snare comple uh, protein complex before the release of acetylcholine into the cleft and so on and so forth. And only follow that this is the botulism toxin kind of primary pathway. Four steps are needed. First of all, Botox is a, a dipeptide. It has a heavy chain and a light chain joined by a disul disulfide bond. The heavy chain binds to um, the nerve terminal and is uh, incorporated within the cytosol. The light chain is then translocated, uh, the little red one in the middle, out into the cytosol where it interacts with any number of the components of the snare complex protein. SNAP25 just happens to be where Botox A uh, interacts and therefore inter disrupts the ability of uh, the vesicle full of acetylcholine to, jun to join with the uh, nerve terminal. In fact, a number of other pathways have been discovered with uh, the use of uh, botulism toxin, ranging from the inhibition of release of substance P from afferent nerves, inhibition of ATP release from urothelial cells, and the downregulation of capsaicin receptors on afferent neurons within the bladder. Uh, all of which suggest that perhaps botulism toxin is working by more than just this primary release of acetylcholine type pathway, and in fact, it works on symptoms such as overactive bladder by a number of different pathways. So I alluded to the fact that botulism A uh, works on SNAP25 and you would only follow that. There, there's other serotypes and in fact there's seven, only two of which are used clinically. But botulism A is really grand, got traction because it's thought to have higher efficacy and also have a more favorable uh, side effect profile, and hence it is why it's used so much. There's no, important thing to know about Botox, there's no real standardized technique in how um, it's administered. And I have just a short clip that we'll go into just in a moment, which, uh, which shows kind of how we did it uh, in one case with Dr. Afshar. It's uh, typically administered in 10 to 30 sites, and typically people are using 30, but in fact there's some data which perhaps suggests that 10 uh, provide, is less painful and provides similar uh, effectiveness. Well, why don't we, uh, I'll just show a little clip of this video how we uh, administer it. So this is uh, a 10 year, a 10 year old girl with a lipomeningomycele and refractory to CIC, anticholinergic, still having high detrusive lipoid pressures, uh, low capacity. So you'll see here, let me get it working. 
it being administered here. And you'll notice just on the kind of lower left, eventually the, uh, the UO will pop into place. What we're trying to do is put this uh, Botox right into the detrusor muscle. If anyone have ever used something like Deflex, you know kind of that pouting of the urothelium. And that's not really what we're looking for in this sort of setting. And I'll actually just go for it a little bit here. to show you kind of how this looks at the end where you have kind of an, you're right there. You see how it kind of pouted out? That's more of a sub urothelial Okay, I'm back to the talk. So it's uh, Botox administered either under general or local anesthesia, and it's really kind of a patient and surgeon preference. Preoperative antibiotics are usually administered, and the dosage, again, is Nothing that's, it's not something that's really been proven, but it's, for the most part, for idiopathic OAB, 100 to 200 units have been used. For neurogenic, people have tended to use a higher dose, 200 to 300 units. And we'll go into why that might be a little later on. So some tips and tricks. Uh, it's important to tell your scrub nurse or yourself uh, when you're preparing the material, not to shake the vial as you're mixing it up. So it'll in fact break those disulfide bonds between the light and heavy chain and make the, the drug less effective. People have described using methylene blue to kind of help map out where you've been and where you need to go next, rather than just a bunch of kind of uh, small holes in the bladder urethelium, which are sometimes hard to find uh, after you've kind of gone back and forth like a typewriter. Important to ask about other uses of Botox, especially in people say, who have cerebral palsy, may have had it for spasticity. It's been generally uh, thought to wait 30 days to decrease the, the risk of systemic weakness in between the uses of Botox. And I know at UBC, we culture them seven days prior to the administration of Botox, and if this is positive, give them a three to five day uh, treatment course of oral antibiotics before Botox injection, because we know that systemic uh, sepsis is a side effect of, this, of administration. So this is a a trial, just going back to that kind of discussion in regards to whether or not to inject into the sub urothelial space as shown in by B, or right down into the detrusor muscle. And uh, Kuo f took 45 patients, and in fact also did a group uh, putting in through the bladder base, but he took 15 in each uh, and put some in the sub urothelial space and then 15 in the detrusor space and found similar uh, effectiveness between the two groups. Despite this, people still seem to be doing uh, in clinical practice and in research trials right into the detrusor muscle. A trigone, also sort of an area of controversy, is into whether or not to inject this area. Uh, by and large, urologists have avoided injecting the trigone because of this theoretical worry of inducing vesicoureteric reflux by interfering with the adrenergic control of the uh, smooth muscle and the intramural ureter. The counter-argument to that would be that we know that AOB is not just an efferent phenomenon, that in fact there's a lot of afferent uh, input and an impact that it has, and we know that in the trigone the sensory fibers and sensory nerves are, are more uh, dense in that area, and perhaps injecting into the trigone provide greater efficacy. And also in, doesn't, it goes without saying that uh, the afferent role within pelvic pain disorders is by and large kind of what the driving force. So uh, a group, group out of McGill did quite a small study, but they took 11 women you know, with uh, idiopathic OAB, injected 20 units over 10 sites throughout the uh, trigone, and did video urodynamics at baseline and then at six weeks when the botulism toxin ought to have its come maximum effect. And zero out of 10 had reflux. One person actually at baseline had low uh, grade reflux bilaterally. There was no worsening of reflux at the six week time. So, uh, perhaps we can inject the trigone without fear of inducing reflux. Duration of effect, typically about six to nine months. Um, again, there's no great studies looking at this. Onset usually by two weeks. Repeated injections don't seem to induce tolerance. And if it doesn't work the first time, probably best not to try again. Um, although if you use a small dose and you get a partial effect, certainly it's worth discussing with the patient trying a larger dose and seeing if that doesn't work. The one study that did look at this uh, was by Brubaker last year, or I guess two years, a year and a half ago now, um, which looked at placebo versus botulism A in a randomized trial, and they found that botulism toxin, in fact, actually lasted 
uh, a median time of about a year. It was sort of a funny study because they, you see that placebo lasted two months, and that's because that's the first time they actually looked at these patients. So the minimum you could get was two months. So most of these patients, especially in the neurogen, well, in both populations, probably are going to be on an anticholinergic. And it's what to do with that anticholinergic when you start the Botox has been poorly reported. In an EUA systematic review, uh, they mentioned that about 25 to... What happened there? Any event, about 25 to 58 percent of the time... Oh, it's back. Um, they discontinued it, and in fact, in the pediatric literature, they, uh, Newell took, uh, did a randomized trial of about 40-odd patients and split them into two groups, with oxybutynin and without oxybutynin. You know, both the, the middle one's a month, and the one on the right is six months, really was no augmentative effect of keeping them on their anticholinergic after Botox injection. Similarly, with the truser pressure, really no difference but whether or not you kept them on the anticholinergic or whether you stopped it after you injected them with Botox. And kind of something everyone's interested in these days uh, is how much this stuff costs. It's not FDA approved. It's not typically covered uh, by general medical plans. And if you're looking at about 200 units uh, twice a year, it's going to cost about $1,200. But it is covered by uh, extended health, sometimes by WCB. Um, and if an FDA uh, indication eventually comes about, perhaps it'll be covered uh, for everyone. Adverse effects, you think, well, you're injecting this one of the most potent neurotoxins into the body. There must be something that bad that happens. Um, the most common things are UTIs and injection site pain, running kind of 20, 10, somewhere in there uh, percent. One that becomes more of a worry, especially for those idiopathic OAB type patients, uh, is the retention or elevated PVR. And the rates are all over the map, and that's in large part just because of dosing, but also because how these people are looking at retention. Some people say a post void residual of 100 cc's is retention. Other people say they have to be uncomfortable. Um, so you can probably tell your patients in and around 5 to 15 percent of people will require at least CIC uh, for a short period of time. It can last a number of months. The one that's really of an issue, especially with those high uh, spinal cord lesion patients, um, is generalized weakness. It's, there's no real way of see, predicting who this is going to happen, and it can last upwards of uh, three months if it does occur. Self-limited, but if you have a high uh, spinal cord lesion and you already have limited lung function, systemic weakness certainly would be of concern. So, before we delve into kind of the data supporting its use, you kind of have to ask yourself why Botox? And certainly OAB, neurogenic DO, uh, has an effect on quality of life and morbidity. We know uh, incontinence has an, certainly a, an impact on falls and fractures in the elderly. Within the neurogenic population, there's the danger of high pressure storage and its effect on the upper tracts. Anticholinergics don't work about a third of the time and certainly have a, a whole gamut of side effects that have been well described. Kind of the other ways of uh, treating these refractory patients are either augmentation, and certainly that's very morbid, uh, procedure both in the short and long term and sacral neuromodulation isn't even involved in um, available in British Columbia at the present time and carries with it a great cost so just a couple quick definitions before we we get right into it neurogenic DO or duro uh, before that detrusor overactivity is a urodynamic finding of involuntary detrusor contractions during filling follows that neurogenic DO is just DO associated with a neurological condition. And then OAB is more of a symptom complex associated with urgency, as you would expect, with or without urgency incontinence, and usually associated with frequency. And really, this might be the most kind of important slide when you're treating these patients, and that is, what, is, what are you looking for out of treating these patients? And with a neurogenic population, you want continent low pressure storage, which is distinctly different than the idiopathic OAB population where you're looking for symptomatic relief for the most part. Well, just a, a quick case. Uh, this is uh, a gentleman who had a spinal cord injury due to a skiing accident, T8. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have details in terms of how his bladder was being managed. Um, but this was his pre-Botox aerodynamics showing a very low capacity, rising uh, detrusor pressure, rising intravesical pressure very early on. After Botox was administered, you see his capacity has doubled. 
And really, his, uh, his intravesical pressures stayed in compliance. is really quite remarkably different uh, throughout the filling cycle. So this was the first study uh, looking at the neurogenic population in 2000. 36 weeks, open label, not randomized, nothing like that. 21 patients, but you see really remarkable differences. The capacity rise, rose by about 50%. PDET max went down to below that kind of threshold level of 40 on average. And of the 19 patients who went for follow-up at six weeks, 17 were completely continent. And at the 36-week marker, 11 patients came back for follow-up and all were completely continent. So the EUA published a, a, a systematic review last year, which looked at 18 articles comprising about 700 patients, of which only two of which were RCTs. And again, they found really remarkable results uh, when they pooled all their data or looked at their data kind of as a group. 40 to 90% were completely continent. Similar numbers uh, had decreased, well, 60 to 80% had decreased uh, daily incontinence episodes. Their quality of life increased, and capacity was markedly increased from a baseline, which most people would think was uh, quite low. A couple of quick graphs. Again, continents, you look at the numbers. Most are over 50%, especially those, the ones marked with the arrows, which are the randomized controlled trials, along with rights over on the right side, which was the largest trial, comprising 200 patients. And again, PET at max. Really what this shows is, is that it does decrease about 50% when you look at kind of the, the numbers pre and post, but it also emphasizes that you need to follow these patients with urodynamics following Botox, because there is going to be a number of them which don't respond adequately and don't get below that level of 40 centimeters of water, which we're really looking for to protect the upper tracks. Uh, one just randomized control trial of note, looking at uh, about 40 or 50 patients. Uh, again, from a baseline of about two incontinence episodes a day, really about half to that in the Botox group as compared to placebo. And this uh, effect was carried out all the way to the end of the trial at 24 weeks. Again, quality of life showing market uh, differences between the two groups. Again, these differences being carried out well out uh, to the end of the trial, all the way out to 24 weeks. So, just in summary, neurogenic uh, DO, the goal we always have to keep in, in mind is continent low pressure storage. And expectations, which you could tell patients about, that there's a 100% increase in capacity. But half of the time, or a little bit more, they're going to be completely continent. Their PDET, uh, which protect their upper tracts, will decrease about half, and they should expect at least six months duration before requiring another injection. The pediatric literature obviously has a, a large population of these patients with the myelomeningocele uh, kids. And, and so there was also a review published just last year looking at six open label trials, about 100 patients, and similar results to, to adults where, hmm, I'll just keep going. <laughs> Amen. Keep going, just a test. <laughs> so, most become dry, the capacity increases at least 50%, and for the most part, it's been well tolerated um, with really no systemic side effects noted. Again, re-emphasizing the need to follow these patients with urodynamics because although it decreases 30 to 50%, you see most of these numbers are still kind of hovering at your target. It's not like they drop to 10 to 15 in all cases. A couple quick cases. Um, this was one patient, 13 years old, uh, MM patient, who had a very low capacity. You see the uh, detrusive pressure starting to rise up towards 40. And then following Botox, the pressures are much lower, about half of what they be, were before. Capacity at a much more manageable level. She had been on anticholinergics and ditropan before. And similarly, uh, a 10-year-old boy, ambulatory MM, neurogenic bladder on CIC and ditropan. Kind of maxed out the medical management side of things. Low capacity, a very high uh, PDET. And the PDET was much improved, but of note, the capacity actually didn't, got worse. So I'm not really sure what to make of that, but he's certainly in a safer position and hasn't required 
um, augment or anything more invasive to this point. So we'll touch quickly on idiopathic OAB. Again, we've already kind of gone over that it's a prevalent condition, it's a morbid condition, affects your quality of life, and that other options, including interstim, aren't available. So, urgency. Uh, Dr. Chapel was here last year sometime, and uh, he talked about kind of a few different mechanisms of OAB. Sudden detrusor contractions with increased intravesical pressure, afferent nerves play a role along with increased release of chemical neurotransmitters from the urothelium, and in wet cases, this involuntary relaxation of the sphincter. And he go on, goes on to talk that urgency is really the driving force of idiopathic OAB that leads to all the other uh, symptoms. Oh, that's annoying. <laughs> so going back to just this slide quickly, you can think as we went over the, how Botox works, and it really looked at each of these factors. It looked at, well, obvious acetylcholine, which would address that first point. It looked it impacted on uh, the release of substance P, which looked at the second point. Impacts on the inhibition of, yes? Sure. Yeah. Because you think that interaction would be not so durable. So yeah, it's, any for that? no, there's not really been any great studies on that, and um, so I don't have a great answer. The other interesting point is why people with idiopathic OAB can still void. You would think if it's going to work, it's going to work on all those motor neurons, and why can these people still have a voluntary uh, detrusor contraction while it impairs this kind of involuntary uh, contraction. I don't have a good answer for that either and, and looked for it in the literature and there's best I could tell maybe I could be corrected at the end of the talk but I haven't found a good reason for it. So uh, this was the first study looking at idiopathic OAB. It was a randomized controlled trial. Quite severe patients. Frequency upwards of 15 times. 10 urgency incontinence uh, episode, or urge episodes a day. Kind of having episodes of incontinence upwards of four to five times a day. We treated with them with 200 units uh, and noted improved urgency, frequency, incontinence all by about a third at uh, a follow up at anywhere from kind of four to 12 weeks, kind of had fairly durable effects. But you'll note at the bottom, this is more of an issue for the idiopathic population uh, that close to 40% were on CIC for a time, and you need to discuss that with your patients because unlike the neuro, uh, neurogenic population where retention might actually be a goal because they're continent at that point and already on CIC, it may not be tolerable for uh, your idiopathic OIB patients. This trial actually isn't published yet but was presented at the AUA last year, the largest trial to date by uh, uh, a multinational kind of group, looked at over 300 patients, split them into six groups, placebo in six different doses of uh, Botox, and looked at them all at 12 weeks, the primary endpoint being uh, incontinence episode uh, per week. Now this I saw is, uh, kind of shows a flattening of the curve at 150 units, which is the first study to show that there actually is a dose response curve that flattens out and there's minimal kind of additional uh, response to even while pushing the envelope. Certainly lots of effect up, up to that point. And they also noted, uh, as you would expect, decrease in weekly voids, urgency, but also, as you might expect, a dose-dependent uh, increase in uh, capacity. Uh, and even more so, showing that maybe 150 is the optimal dose, as they showed a dose-dependent increase in PVRs over 200 once you got beyond that kind of threshold level of 150 units. They showed that as you kind of cross that threshold level, you had increased uh, adverse effects, upwards of kind of 60% in some groups with UTIs uh, and need for CIC. Uh, this was a, kind of the most recent trial out of Duke, which looked at uh, 22 patients, placebo versus uh, 2 to 300 units of uh, Botox. They were doing a second stage, so they couldn't tell you kind of which person got 200, which person got 300, and again looked at uh, kind of incontinence. You notice market differences, uh, really a decrease in incontinence episodes by about 50%. And uh, in, in incontinence questionnaire validated, again, decreases of upwards of 50%. So, 
In summary, idiopathic overactive bladder, the goal is symptomatic relief. Uh, the dose response curve suggests that perhaps 150 units is the optimal dose. You can tell patients that they'd expect their incontinence episodes to decrease by about 50%, decrease their episodes of frequency and urgency by about 33%, but that coupled by those kind of positive things that they may need to be on self-intermittent catheterization uh, for upwards of a few months in about 5 to 15% of cases. So other uses in urology. This is as often is the case with new treatments. Everyone and their dog kind of wants a piece of the, the pie and uh, I've used it in all sorts of areas. So the rationale for Botox, why would you possibly think this is going to work is in rat models, denervation of the prostate leads to atrophy. And also in animal models, Botox A does the same thing, induces prosthetic atrophy and aptososis. We also know just from that very early in the talk that it affects other pathways. It inhibits uh, norepinephrine as well, and perhaps this also works on the dynamic component of BPH. So it, perhaps it's going to kind of work on the problem from two different aspects. So really there's just one trial that uh, addresses this in a randomized sort of way. It's a one-year trial, 30 patients, 200 units, 100 kind of into each side of the prostate. And patients who had fairly severe kind of IPSS scores. At two months, uh, really it was just a subject, their primary endpoint was a subjective kind of um, thing. And 87% that said that they were much improved versus only 10% who received placebo. And at 12 months, these effects uh, were still quite durable. IPSS scores were decreased by 60 odd percent. Their Q max was improved, PVR decreased. Um, the size decreased uh, on truss ultrasound. And a note, and something to, if you were to apply this, you need to know that it affects the PSA, uh, and then that may impact how you follow these patients in regards to uh, prostate cancer screening. And the effect that it, it actually affects the PSA is just one trial. I think it's still unknown how much it actually affects it. So there's limited data to show that Botox is effective at 12 months, um, probably through both um, cholinergic, adrenergic pathways, along with just a decrease in the size of the prostate. But you kind of have to ask yourself that we do have minimally invasive, effective treatments um, for BPH, and whether or not the uh, Botox will gain traction still seems kind of unlikely in this field. Maybe I'll stand corrected in a few years. Interstitial cystitis, it would only uh, it sort of followed that people thought this might be a good application of Botox. Um, and two trials out of uh, Italy looked at both one-year and two-year data and uh, effects on VAS, a visual analog scale, uh, follow-up. And there really was a, a very positive effect, kind of 87 versus 27 percent, or rather 87 percent at three months, and then you note it kind of as you head out to five, six months, this effect starts to wear out. What's important here is, is the two out of 15 retention rate. These patients, as you know, often as their bladder fills, start to have pain that's much, much worse than it otherwise normally would be. And if you go, uh, Dr. Teichman, you take these patients and you tickle their bladder with potassium and require them to do intermittent catheterization, it's really not going to be tolerable to someone who has interstitial cystitis. So as opposed to where it may be a goal in the neurogenic population, an inconvenience to the idiopathic OIB patient, this is really going to be kind of the worst case scenario for someone with interstitial cystitis. And in fact, it's going to make their symptoms much worse. Uh, they did a second trial looking at two-year data on 13 patients. Again, these, all this data is very small numbers. Um, repeat injections at a median of five months and noted that the effect kind of persisted at two years and there didn't seem to be uh, any degree of tolerance. And finally, Kuo uh, and Chancellor looked at taking uh, patients treated with hydrodistension and either randomizing them to hydrodistension or giving them Botox two weeks before the hydrodistension and proceeding. Uh, they kind of grouped their, their patients into uh, 100 and 200 units. All the patients were on Elmeron, and they looked at uh, how they did. Now, this was really more of a, a symptom score type study, and you note the red line being the Botox plus hydrodistension did much better over, uh, in terms of kind of overall survival on this symptom score uh, versus placebo. So perhaps there's an additive effect and a role for combination therapy in the field of interstitial cystitis. So, future directions. Of course, we could always, you can head down different ways, spinal shock, who knows, but really what's needed in this field is larger RCTs. 
Um, most studies are 40, 50 patients, um, not very large. We still haven't really standardized the dosage and a frequency of administration. Even how to administer it is still sort of up in the air and done mostly on expert opinion. Long-term safety, you kind of get this kind of feeling that perhaps we're missing something in the long run. And, It'd be interesting to see over the next few years whether more systemic weakness pops up or impact on lung function pops up that we're just not seeing or not looking for. I know in most of the, the trials now, especially in the neurogenic population, you have to get pulmonary function tests before and after the administration of uh, Botox, so perhaps that will shed light on the issue. And certainly a cost analysis in this day and age, how it pairs up versus inner stim, how it pulls, uh, versus augment and any number of things, uh, things that we haven't even thought about. So take home, really the goals of treatment are the most important when you're treating these patients, whether or not it's a neurogenic population and you're looking just for them to be continent and have low storage, or whether you want symptomatic relief, and that really dictates the dosage that you're going to use. Really the neurogenic population has been treated for longer, more robust data. Certainly with uh, the inclusion of this new 300 patient trial, the, the data seems to be piling up for idiopathic OIB as well. At the present time, I, I don't think you can really make any great conclusions in the, its role in IC or BPH. The trials are small um, and certainly have their problems. So I'd uh, be happy to take any questions um, and invite Dr. Stuthers to kind of join me in the discussion and we'll go from there.